Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Brian Kim of Transparent Knives. Brian has uh, made his name in the knife modification arena, especially, specifically when it comes to regrinding and even reblading some of the most beloved factory knives. I've seen transparent blades of the Demco 80 20.5 and Benchmade Bugout that have genuinely moved me, and his work on the 940, in my uh, opinion, completely redeems the model. Brian also designs the build, designs and builds his own line of fixed blade knives, ranging from large outdoors knives to EDC pocket fixed blades. Now, a key part of Brian's work is the heat treatment of blades and Rockwell testing of their hardnesses. But recently, this process has thrust Brian into conflict with a well-known knife uh, world stalwart. We'll hear all about it, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and remember that you can download the show audio only uh, onto your favorite podcast apps and listen to the show while you're doing the stuff you got to do. As always, you can go to Patreon to help support the show. You get exclusive content. You're, you'll see extra of this interview, for instance, uh, knife giveaways and more. Quickest thing to do is go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and sign up. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Brian, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on, Bob. Hey, it's a pleasure. I, I want to congratulate you for uh, becoming kind of the, the reblader to the stars, so to speak. All, all of my trusted voices of YouTube have have been getting your reblades, and I've been seeing them. Uh, you send stuff to Knife Modders. I've been seeing your reblades, and like I mentioned in my intro, I really like what you're doing, especially with certain models that I'm not fond of, like the 940. Uh, you have totally transformed them in my eyes. Um, so, congratulations on your success in in that arena and the and the uh, and the re grinding of blades. Uh, how did you get into this? Uh, into knife into knives in general or knife making? Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah. knives is like really it's a really really short story. No. Um, basically, I had a friend in high school. He looked at some gentlemen's quarterly like magazines and stuff at the time. And people and the magazine said, "Hey, you know, real real gentlemen use or, or carry pocket knives." And he's like, "Okay, I'm gonna do that." And so he bought a Kershaw leak, and then he showed it to me, and he's like, "Yo, this knife is sick." And I didn't know anything about knives at the time, like you know, I didn't I didn't cook or anything, so I didn't even use kitchen knives. Like I had no experience with knives whatsoever. But I, I held the leak, I flipped it once, and I was like, "Yeah, that's pretty cool." <laughs> so I I bought a leak of my own. Um, he had a completely silver one. I got a black one. And it escalated because, you know, once I got the leak, I looked it up, you know, I looked at reviews and people were like, well, if you like this, you got to try this too. And so it was a, it was a gateway drug of sorts. And I started getting to Spyderco and to Benchmade, you know, eventually got a Chris Reeves Sabenza. And I don't know if I want to say went downhill from there, but definitely my spending escalated. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did end up spending a lot of money. Like I, I, pretty quickly bought my first custom which was an andre thorburn um mm. i forget the number because it's like l and then a number like he doesn't have like model names but that's like a over 800 dollars knife right with like zirconium in it and like you know engraved bolsters <clears throat> and you know one question that came to my mind was i was like I, I appreciate the work right i know a lot of work went into this but i want to know exactly how much work and i want to know why knives cost how much however much they do because it's not very clear if you just join, like, why is this knife this exact amount of money? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it like, cause like you, you, as you do more research, you find out, okay, the materials cost this much. Okay. Well, that doesn't account for much of the cost of the knife. So then you start looking at, well, you know, okay. If they, if they are, if they're grinding higher hardness steels, that costs more money, right? Cause you need more abrasives and stuff takes more time. Okay. So that explains some cost for like things like Maximet, right? Like that's why Maximet costs more than, s30v hmm. right so you know i there was a point i reached where i was like one i would like to make my own knives just because i think it's cool uh, but two when i make my own knives i want to make it clear to people why my knives cost however much they do 
and that's where the name transparent knives really started where i was like i want to be transparent about my process i want to show what i do right like how how much i value my time like so this takes this much time and i value my time at this much money so that's why this costs this much and then i did what's what i call price breakdowns where i say okay I just list it. This costs this. Um, I spent two hours grinding. I spent blah, blah, blah. And I just list how much each part of the process costs, add it all up. And then that's the, that's the total cost of the knife, you know, or the blade. Um, and that, that's sort of where transparent knives started is like, um, I started off with fixed blades. Um, I had a, uh, I didn't, I've always been very like iffy on like blade design because I think it's hard to make a unique design. Um, mm. So the first knife I ever made, I called it the typical because i was like it's just a yeah. typical knife and i just i made a pun on it i spelled it t-i-p you know typical whatever and i was just like look it's a typical knife it's a drop point with the normal like curvy handle that's like comfortable for the hand and like yeah, <laughs> like i'm just trying to make a knife here i'm not trying to like you know make waves in the design world right like i'm just trying to right. start out so that that knife to me was like kitchen or camp i can't decide and that yeah. to see that seemed to be the point in that design like an overall yeah, I just like a, it, it works as a knife, you know, it's supposed to just be a platform where I can practice the basic skills, like how to make handles or how mm -hmm. to shape them, how to grind, how to sharpen. Like I needed a starting point and fixed blades are a great starting point for any maker. Like I highly recommend if you're trying to make your first knife, do a fixed blade, you know, yeah. like they're much more simple than all the moving parts of a folder. And you're going to spend a lot of time probably not doing all the elements of a folder very well if it's your first try some people just bang it out and just are perfect from the beginning and those are very lucky people who are very talented i am not one of those people so i just said look i'm just gonna i'm just gonna make a blank and then slap some scales on and call it a day like that's where, that's where we're gonna start so yeah well talent or not it all takes hard work to to make it work so uh you know you might have to work a little bit harder without that natural talent but mm -hmm you know in the end it's it's who's willing to stick with it and and really um i, I want to go back to the origin of transparent knives the name we were talking about pricing and how do you account for uh in this transparent model how do you account for uh the the um intangibles of being a creator uh my my time as a creator my time as someone who or or, or this as intellectual property this design as my design um, how, how does that get priced in? You cannot just do it by the materials right. and the machine time. So like the vision and stuff and the idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, to be honest, like if it was me, um, and I come out with my first folding knife design and I think it's unique, I would charge, like, I would say like, this is how much it costs to design it. Like I would, you know, like this is mentally how much I think my design, like the time I put in CAD or whatever to mm -hmm. draw it all out and think about it and make it unique from everyone else is like, I would put a number value on that. The reason I don't do that for reblades though, um, is because I feel like it's not really my idea, um, because I'm not the first person to do a reblade, right? And when it comes to all the different shapes that I do, like, yeah, like some of them are like my own design, right? That I made up myself, but some of them are like customers designs or, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's just generic designs, like a Warncliffe is a Warncliffe, right? You can't really change it that much. It's still just going to be a Warncliffe at the, at the end of the day, right? Like it's going to have a straight edge. The spine is going to have some sort of like, you can change the spine a bit, but I, I never really thought of it in terms of like intellectual property that much. It's not something I'm big on personally. Um, and, and this is, I know, I noticed that this is a big thing in the knife community recently where people are very big on intellectual property where they're like, Hey, don't copy my, this don't copy my, that I've never been like that though. Personally, um, I've had people reach out to me saying, Hey, Brian, um, I ha I want to do this thing, but I think it's too close to what you're doing. Are you okay with it? And I always tell people, do not ask me for permission. Like I do not care. Even if someone straight up copied me, I'm not out here complaining about it because it just doesn't matter to me. Um, I don't know. That, that's, that's my take on it. I, I don't blame anyone who does want to protect their intellectual property. I'm not saying they shouldn't, mm -hmm. but me personally, I just feel like there's so much demand. I can't even meet my demand or even close anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't see a reason why I need to care if someone wants to like do something similar to me. I think, uh, when it comes to reblades, yeah, that makes perfect uh, sense to me. And then when it comes to original ideas and making, um, you know, actually crafting the original ideas or having them made, um, to me, that's something different to me. And, yeah. and when I say intellectual property, I, 
that's a fancy, more of a fancy term than I intend to to say. I just mean like that personal uh, artistic um, thing that you imbue that design with that mm -hmm. no one else could do. Um, yeah. Uh, that's that thing that how the hell do you charge for that? That's always a, I mean, that's a quandary, not just in knives, but in, in for sure. Everything. Yeah. The way I think of it is um, prices are just so high in general that that part of it, the, the personal artistic part and stuff, I don't need to put a value on it. That's just what makes people buy my stuff over someone else's, you know, it's just like an yeah. added special thing, but I don't think of it. Like I need to make profit on it personally. Um, I'm just like, yeah, this is why people like my stuff. And they're like, you know, they drop a nice comment here and there. Like, I, I'm happy with that. You know, that's good yeah. enough for me. So, yeah. well, describe what it was like the first time you took someone else's knife um, and and took it to a grinder to to reshape the blade. Um, oh, man. You know, you, yeah. you, uh, you're going to reblade something. You can always mess up that blank and start from scratch. But someone right. sends you a, a knife, you know. What was that? Yeah. Like? So I was, I, I'm in um, some discord servers. Right. And so my friends in the discord server was like, were like, Brian, you know, you do, you do, you grind fixed blades. Why can't you just grind a knife that already exists and make, make it thinner. And in my head at the time, I was like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Like that sounds simple. It's really not that simple, <laughs> but I was like, um, yeah, I'll try it. And so, you know, um, so, I, but I was afraid, right. That I'd like mess things up. Cause like, Everyone, even like the really talented people, like um Josh at Razor Edge Knives, he's probably the most talented regrinder that I know of. He did um, although one. right, although he doesn't regrind that much anymore because he's busy doing his, you know, his original designs right, now. Right. But um, but even Josh, like if you ask him, like he's messed up on customers' knives before. Like no one is like able to just never mess up, right? Um, even if you're the most talented. So I knew that I would mess up, oh, but my friends sent me like some cheaper knives. You know, they're like, Hey, if, if you mess this up, I'm not going to be mad at you. And I was like, Oh, thanks. And I also bought cheaper knives for the express purpose of just practicing. Um, and it was, it was, uh, it was terrifying at first. Um, I was, Cause like, I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to mess it up. And I did mess them up. <laughs> um, you know, like, and that's the thing about grinding is that if you don't go into it with confidence, you're going to mess up. Like it's like, I don't want to make it seem like some like spiritual voodoo shit, but like, <laughs> you know, but really the grinder feels when you're not confident because your hands are shaky or they're not as steady. Like you're not applying consistent pressure. Um, you know, so the, the confidence wasn't there. I messed up a lot of stuff, you know, grinds were wonky or I blew out the edge or something. Cause you know, when you're getting really thin, if you go too, if you go too much to one side, you can go into the other side. Right. And you blow out your edge. It's doomed. Right. So, um, there are a lot of different ways you can mess up, but I, I, I messed up in all the possible ways, <laughs> but after a while I was like getting the hang of it, you know? And, and one thing I did, which I'm going to stand by it, but some people are still mad at me over it. Um, I would buy, uh really rare like limited edition knives right to up the pressure you know and i was like okay <laughs> oh like God. i'm gonna i'm gonna feel so bad if i mess this up but i'm but the way it was like sort of like simulating like how i would feel if i messed up a customer's knife mm. so i so i had like you know a tashi barucha rowdy right which is a limited edition knife and i was like i'm gonna try to regrind this <laughs> and i and i was like i'm gonna treat this as if it's a real like you know real life like simulation of what it would be if it was a customer's knife i killed that knife i destroyed it oh, but, oh. but but once it happened i realized to myself like you know there are some ways around this like one obviously practicing every day so that happens less and less often yeah but also just like being clear with customers look this is a intensive modification process stuff happens i could mess up if i do mess up i'll buy you a new knife if it's a knife that can't be replaced don't send it to me <laughs> Yeah, you know, I noticed. I noticed on your page it also says nothing over five hundred bucks. Right, because it's like I don't want to. I don't want to pay anyone five hundred bucks if I mess it up. So I was like, don't send that to me. <laughs> yeah, Josh. Uh, Josh at Razor Edge. After he he reground one, I wanted to send him another one, a, a, an XM twenty four, and he's like, nah, that's too expensive. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. If I and, yeah. and I I didn't think of that up until that moment. I'm like, yeah, of course, because if he messes this up, of course I would expect him to replace it. You know, and, right. And uh, I can understand not wanting to be on the on the rope for 600 bucks or whatever it is. And one thing to consider is that most of the time um, our pricing on regrinds is static. And what that means is that no matter how expensive your knife is, the cost of the regrind is about the same, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make sense because the risk is higher with a more expensive <clears throat> knife. 
it's sort of like how insurance works, right? When you ship something that's more expensive, you pay more insurance, right? And that's the way when you expect the postal office to reimburse you, well, you paid more insurance because you're asking for more back. But when we do regrinds, you know, whether it's a $200 knife or a $500 knife, I'm charging you the same, but my risk is so much higher. So it makes, it discourages me from wanting to do that more expensive knife, you know? Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, does uh, blade steel type factor into the pricing? Um, it does, but only in very extreme cases, like the difference okay. between like, if it's like Rex 121 or Maximet or something like insanely different, right? Uh, because like, if it's like CPM 154 versus like M390, it's like, okay, whatever, you know, like, yeah. obviously there's a big difference, but it's not enough that like, I really care. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's like, if you're comparing CPM 154 to Rex 121, it's like, dude, are these even, <laughs> this isn't even the same task anymore, you know? Right. So you go through a lot more expendable materials and right and that kind of thing it's just um, the time mostly the time um you know having to go slow not overheat it um if you build up to and the other thing is like with certain steels um you know if you're like wet grinding right which you should be um <clears throat> you know you don't want to like have it rust or anything you know like because it's you're getting it wet and there's heat from the grinding you know that's yeah, like yeah. certain steels are you you, you got to be more careful you know and there, there are some ways around it but it's still you got to be if you, the more careful you have to be basically um the more tedious it is so right right and and also obviously those materials are more expensive mm -hmm. so how did the reblading come about so I, I have a few funny stories about that actually so um it started out with um i'm i'm i i started out on reddit um reddit is where i you know joined the knife community for the first time Mm -hmm. um that's where i got all my initial information recommendations on what knives i should try out that's where i learned about benchmade and spider co um it's just reddit um knife club right um and there was this person who posted on knife club this cardboard blade that he had made as a concept and he he was trying to find someone who would make it for him mm. and that was what introduced me to the idea of reblading and specifically what he wanted was a reblade for a 940 with a spidey hole oh. um and so as you know now, um, Josh from Razor Edge Knives actually ended up being the person he chose to make that. Um, and but you know, but but that was actually a, pro a project that took a long time to actually happen. And you know, every every month or so, he would post an update. Hey guys, I changed the design a little bit. What do you think? You know, and I would see it because I'm on Reddit. And you know, other people saw it and they're like, "Yo, Brian, like you should try to do something like that." You know, like that looks really cool. Like, um, so. I started, you know, prototyping, trying to figure out how do you do reblades, right? How do I get the lock geometry right? You know, that's the main yeah. important part. How do I get, you know, the action good and stuff like that? And then, um, and then at a certain point, like I finally made a prototype. Um, but you know, because I was just prototyping, like I just did his exact same blade shape, right? Um, and he actually reached out to me. He said, "Hey, you know, I and mean, this is where you sort of like the intellectual property idea comes in, right?" He was like, "Hey, I really wanted this to be like a special thing that just like." um that just i have and the people who like joined me in the initial order from josh so i'd appreciate it if you didn't do that blade shape which is why and like i don't personally care if people copy me but if mm. someone asks me not to copy them then i'll respect it which is why if you go through all of the 940 blade shapes i've ever done i've never done that yeah. exact shape that is beautiful that one i'm looking at i'm sorry to interrupt you no no, no. uh but but Right, I, I get that, and and I understand that if he's if he's planning on making it an exclusive small run knife for a small group of people, yeah, I get that. Yeah, he was he just wanted it to be special, and I I always back that. It was like it had sentimental value to him. He had spent months, you know, posting here and there. Hey, here's this project that I like. You know, I'm super passionate about. So I was like, yeah, no problem. I won't make. I won't do your design. I'll just do other blade shapes. So that's why you know I do a bunch of different blade shapes. Um, but that was where I came up with the idea of like, wait, why do I need to settle for one blade shape when I could just have a blank that's like a rectangle and then, you know, just do the lockup and then I can do whatever shape I want by just grinding that rectangle into different shapes. Because normally when people get uh, cut their blade, they cut it exactly the way it's supposed to be from the water yeah. jet. And I was like, well, why don't I just give myself flexibility and do a rectangle and then people can tell me what they want. Yeah. And then I'm just giving people exactly what they want. You know, like I thought that was such a cool idea to be able to really customize and choose exactly the blade shape that you think would be cool for your 940. Um, I, and that, yeah, and, I, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Please go on. 
No, 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 that, that was it. That was it. Yeah. Well, I love that idea. And, and I love the approach too. It's very sculptural. You know, it's like, here's a block of stone, carve away everything that's not David. And, and in this case, it's <laughs> here's your slab of steel. Uh, you know, show me how you want me to carve away everything. That's not your knife. And, yeah. and what a great, I, I've always had, I, I just don't like the 940. And I, the part about the 940 I like is the handle, you know, so you yes. solved that problem. And Jim was just scrolling through your page of 940 reblades. And I saw, uh, you know, pretty much to me and my taste, pretty much every one of those blades was better <laughs> than the original in, in my opinion, because, uh, the, the thing about the original that turns me off the most is how oblique the edge is. Um, you know, it's this, it's this EDC classic, but I, the one I had did not cut very well and it was sharp, you know, yeah. reasonably sharp, but the way you broaden them out and, and, you know, if they look like very thin grinds to me and I don't, I don't know, do you, do you hollow grind? uh knives as well is this <clears throat> um that's a more recent thing i did learn how to hollow grind recently so now i'm doing it a lot because i'm like addicted <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um once you once you learn a skill in knife making you can't stop it's very difficult like because it's so fun to finally succeed at something and be able to do it um so yeah. i only did flat grinds for a while but once i learned hollow grinding like i've like i i told you that i had one knife to show this one is a hollow grind oh that's um, beautiful but uh yeah this oh i have a upset yeah so this blade, right, um, it's hard to show with the light reflecting, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, um, this one's a hollow grind as well. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of my more recent ones are hollow grinds. Um, most of the blades that I'm taking a blade show are going to be hollow grinds. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I started out with flat grinds, but they're always thin. That's the main thing, mm -hmm. is that the geometry is always very, very thin. And it's not because I think that thin is always better than a um, thicker, you know? Um, I think robust blades have a place. Um, you know, outdoors, survival, whatever. But when it comes to EDC, that doesn't make sense to me, especially in a pocket knife. I'm like, if you really want something robust, you know, a fixed blade makes more sense. Um, you know, certain steels make more sense, um, which we can get into if you want. But like, that, that's why I grind everything thin is that I think there's so many robust knives out there. If you want a thick knife, you can buy it from any retail store. You know, like mm -hmm. there's so many thick knives out there. So I try to cater to the people who have a more um what's it called a more specific taste okay. and more specific preferences I, I am interested in uh in your take on steels uh just the other day i was talking about how it makes sense to me to put super steels on smaller edc knives that get the most use um i I carry those big, robust knives that you were just talking about because I just, out of pure enjoyment, I feel nervous if I don't have oh, one cool. in my front right pocket. But then I always have a slip joint or a small flipper or something else that you know I can pull out at work if, if need be. And those are the knives that get the most work. And to me, it seems like those are the knives most deserving of the super steels um, because they get used the most and you... And and will require the least amount of sharpening. What? How do you feel about choosing steels for your purposes? Well, to um, add to your point that you just made, um, I really like that idea because when I think about an EDC, it's typically smaller because it needs to be pocketable and portable, which means that necessarily the blade is going to be smaller, right? Mm -hmm. And because the blade is smaller, that means your edge is not as long. And so if you want a long lasting edge, each section of that edge needs to stay sharp longer. And that's where your super seals and your heat treats and your geometry comes in. Um, because, you know, if you have a, if you have a larger knife, like, yeah, maybe one section gets dull. You can just use another section for a while, mm -hmm. but let's say your knife is three inches. Like the blade is three inches. Like how much edge do you really have? So you need to make sure every inch of that knife, every inch of that blade is actually going to stay sharp, you know, um, for as long as you need it to. So, and also I, I don't like sharpening personally. I don't think it's an enjoyable activity. <laughs> um, so I, I prefer to minimize how much I have to sharpen and having, you know, those things, right. Um, good steel, good heat treat, good geometry that makes it so I have to do something I don't enjoy less often. So interesting. Yeah. Uh, so what are the steels you prefer to work with? To work with? Um, so that's, that's a kind of an interesting question because I, 
there are certain, a lot of seals are easy to work with, right? Like CPM mm-hmm. 154, RWO 34, those are popular with customers or sorry, with custom makers because they're easy to, you know, machine, easy to grind, easy to, you know, hand rub and finish. Um, and so that's why people like to work with them. I don't think about it in those terms though. I like to think about it in terms of what is my customer going to enjoy the most, right? Mm-hmm. I don't care about me. If I need to put in more work, then I'll charge more money. What I care about is what is the thing that I can make that is going to make the person I'm making it for the most happy. And that's what I enjoy working with. Um, so for me, that would be stuff like, um, it's typically going to be hard, high carbide steels. Um, I like steels that stay sharp for a long time, take very keen edges and can support a thin edge. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions, I think, in in, in the knife world, which Laren Thomas, um, the PhD metallurgist, um, he's slowly debunking those and, you know, educating people more on, <laughs> on how things actually work, really. Um, but yeah, like what, one of the main things is that people always talk about, you know, toughness versus like being chippy and stuff like that. Yeah. And I never liked that because whether your knife rolls or it chips, damage is damage. You don't want it, right? Like, I don't Good understand point. why people are like, I'd rather have it roll. I'd rather have it chip. I'm like, dude, either way, you have to resharpen it. Like, it's not going to cut either way. So to me, like, damage is damage. What I care about is the size of the damage because that determines how much I have to resharpen, right? How much material I have to remove. And then the other thing I care about is um, is what is known as edge stability. Um, and edge stability is the combined, um, you know, factors that are involved in minimizing both chipping and rolling, right? So it takes both of those factors into account, right? What will minimize both of those things? Um, and that's what I care about the most. And one thing that's important to edge stability is hardness. You need to have sufficient strength to support a very thin edge. Um, so, you know, let's say like a knife is more likely to roll, right? When it's, when it's softer, the roll will sometimes, if it's soft enough, be bigger than any chip you could have made. Mm. Right. So that's why I consider it to be worse just because the size of the damage is so much worse. Um, and sometimes people say, oh, if it rolls, you can just hone it back to yeah. being, yeah, that's the, this, that, that doesn't I mean, work. <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of what you naturally think like, oh, it's better to roll because at least the material's still there and you can straight, well, you're not going yeah, to be, yeah, it's like you it take your, you take your paper clip, right. And you bend it and you bend it again and you bend it. It's getting weaker and weaker and it's yeah. going to snap off eventually. That's, that, that's how rolls are in a sense, right? You've already basically, you know it's already basically messed up. Like it's fatigued. Um, you're not just going to fix it. And like, you know, it's not going to be brand new just because you bring it back over. So what, well, what, okay. So what have been the most requested steels then? It, if, if it doesn't matter in terms of working with it, I, I'm guessing it's the prestige steels, uh, M390 Magna cut, I'm sure is a big, big one. Um, you know, speaking mm-hmm. of Laren Thomas, uh, sure. but what, what are people ordering? What do people like the best? So in terms of what people ask the most, because I don't always have steels in stock, like in my shop, mm-hmm. uh, but what people ask for the most, um, one is definitely Magna Cut, just because, you know, hype, and it is a good steel. I really do like it. Um, two would be stuff like, um, people want stuff like S9DV. Mm. Um, they want stuff like, they asked me for ZDP 189, but I don't know how to get it, so I can't offer it. Um they asked me for things like Rex 121, just because like they're like, I want to go all the way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the most, the most asked for steel, which unfortunately is hard for me to get because you have to order it in such large quantity, is Vanex. That's probably oh. the most popular steel that people ask for. Um, and it makes sense because Vanex has that, you know, the cool doesn't, you know, doesn't rust factor, right? Yeah. And it also has very, very good edge retention. Um and you know one of the appeals of Vanex to me in a production capacity, right? Which is why I wish it was more popular and more like available, is that Vanex actually caps out at 61 HRC, which sounds very low, right? Like that number does not sound very high when you think about like, well, Maximet can get to like 69, 70 HRC. Why would I want a 61 HRC steel? And that's because the HRC value means different things for each steel. Um, so you know, 61. It's not like 61 HRC Maximet is going to cut the same as 61 HRC Vanex. Because that number means different things for different steels. Explain. So um, the hard, so the hardness is like when you when you take an indent of the hard, like or I should start from the beginning. When you use a rock wall hardness testing device to test how hard a material is, it makes an indent in the steel and it measures how deep it penetrates, right? And all that's telling you is giving you a macro view of how hard it is. 
but it doesn't tell you the microstructure of the steel. It doesn't tell you what specific types of carbides have formed in the steel, right? Because obviously the chemical composition of these steels is different. So they're going to look different mm. under a microscope. Um, and those little differences matter a lot. So for Vanax, um, it's actually very, it's pretty, it's pretty like the edge retention is pretty freaking good. Like for like, you know, for 61 HRC steel, like it's, it's actually going to cut really, really well. Um, to put it in perspective, um, and I think that this is probably the best way to like explain it to people who aren't familiar with like edge retention numbers and, you know, comparing them, um, Let's say, you know, you're looking at like S35 yen, just some normal S35 yen, right? And that's a pretty common steel. People like it. Um, if it's heat treated decently at a, in a factory, it'll cut per inch about like 140, 150, 160, you know, around that ballpark feet of cardboard. You're some good Vanex at 60 to 61 HRC, that can cut like 340, 360, hmm. like almost double, right? right. But it's also complete, more corrosion resistant than S35 yen. And it's pretty tough. You're not going to notice really a difference unless you're, you know, using it in like a fixed blade, like in a more robust setting where you're like subjecting it to impact. And so it's mm -hmm. like, it's tough enough for you to use. Um, I've never seen anyone complain about the toughness of Vanax, um, but you get that really good edge retention and that super cool, you know, corrosion proof factor, which is like, anytime something is a hundred percent anything, yeah, it's cool, right? <laughs> well, well, what's the catch with Vanax? There's got to be a compromise. There, it's so... There, well, there, it's just like it's not that there's a, um, a catch per se, it's more just that the balance is so good of the factors. Mm -hmm. Um, there's really not that many compromises, which is why I like it so much, as well, and probably why it's so popular. Is like you, you consider like Vanex to like something terrible, like 8CR 13 MOV. There's no catch, there's no, there's no situation <laughs> where, there, where 8CR is better, right? right it's just right. overall worse. And so Vanex is overall better than a lot of these steels. Um, okay. So, all right. So you yeah. you were talking about heat treating. <clears throat> Obviously, that's a big part of what you do in the reblading. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know, maybe even in the regrinding, do you reheat treat? Uh, I don't reheat treat. It's okay. reheat treating is a lot more annoying <laughs> than people okay. than people know. Really, um, I would imagine I could, it I would be a lot that, trickier. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah please so, do. So there are there is one person I know who has done reheat treating before, and that's K Knife Switzerland, who is like one of the most knowledgeable people in the knife industry. Um, you know, he's actually been like asked, like you know how Bowler is a manufacturer of steels. Mm. He's been invited to Bowler to like help them work on steels. Like he's very wow. knowledgeable on these subjects, um, and so he can do that kind of stuff. Me, I'm good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and some of the complications are: let's say you haven't. You, let, let's pretend this is a factory knife, right? Um, it's already ground. It's already heat treated. Well, first I'm going to have to anneal it, right? Take it back to its soft form, right? And that's a lengthy, that takes a lot of time. But then when I reheat treat it, um, I have to make sure that since it's already ground, it won't warp, right? Because mm. what the thinner something is, the more likely it is to warp. Right. Um, heat distribution and, you know, the different rates of cooling, um, especially for a hollow grind, like a thin hollow grind, like that's 100% going to warp unless you know some special techniques to make it not warp. Um, the other thing is that your blade is probably the exact thickness it's supposed to be already, right? So when you when you reheat treat it, you need to make sure that you don't need to remove any material because sometimes you get thing, something called decarburization, which is when the, um, the carbon on the surface of your blade reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere and basically you're losing carbon to the atmosphere. And mm -hmm. so the surface of your blade becomes softer and that's mm -hmm. not something that we want. Um, and so you need to find ways to minimize that as well. So there's, there, it's, it's not only a time consuming process, but if you mess up in any part of it, then you've messed up the blade. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's actually sometimes cheaper to make a whole new blade than to reheat treat one and stuff. Yeah. It seems tricky, complicated, risky, and, uh, I, I don't, I, it might not be the same with, um, high carbon steels, like, uh, like the makers use on forged in fire, but I do know that heat treating and then reheat treating can be pro, uh, you know, troublesome to, to grain structure and who knows how you might jack you have that to normalize and stuff. Yeah. There's, there's definitely more processes. I don't know all of them. I've never been interested in learning though, just cause I'm like, I'd rather just make a whole new blade. <laughs> like right. I don't, I don't want to like start tinkering with something else, you know? So you've done um, uh, Rockwell testing of uh, manufacturers' 
blades uh yes that already exist tell me about that yeah so the reason to start this actually is, so first of all i used to send out my own knives to be heat treated which a lot of people do um i used a company called true grit mm -hmm. yeah. um and they and um and there was actually a little bit of drama about this um it's a, it's its own whole story which um to summarize basically one time i sent in a batch and it came back and I, I test because I didn't have a rock wall tester at the time. The only way I could test my knives in any capacity was through primitive means. Um, and so one thing I would do is something I call the hammer and bolt test, where I would hammer the edge of the knife into a bolt at a specific geometry and just see how it holds up. And um, and I see like and then like you know based on having done it to so many knives, I sort of had a ballpark idea of how knives should perform on the test. One time I got my, my knife back from heat treat. I hammered it into a bolt and the knife folded inside up like this entire area folded up into the oh, into up all the way up here. And I was like, that is not a proper heat treat. <laughs> Something went wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, the reason it became drama is because I reached out to the heat treater. I was like, yo, you messed something up. And then they didn't want to re like reimburse me, blah, 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 but whatever that got settled. That's fine now. Um, but the, what I learned from that is I need a way to instantly verify whether or not my knife was heat treated properly. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is to test the hardness, right? Um, so I invested in a Rockwell hardness tester, which is the same one I use today. It's a Grizzly G9645 for anyone who's wondering. It's the same Rockwell hardness tester that um, Laren Thomas uses, for example. Okay. Um, and I was just like, okay, now I, now I can test my knives, right? And I also got two ovens. Um, to heat treat my own knives because I, I I don't like outsourcing. I've had a lot of bad luck outsourcing. Like people just let me down. You know, I'm paying them what they asked me to pay them for the service and then they don't deliver and I get frustrated. You know, I'm like, I wish I could just do this myself. You know, I wish I could just heat treat my own knives, test my own knives and anything that happens, it's my fault. So I, I can't be mad at anyone but myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I got into testing other knives because people started saying, hey, you have a hardness tester. Um, I want to know how hard my knife is. You know, I'm just curious. So people started sending me knives. And it, it's such an easy test to perform. I didn't charge anything for it. And I still don't. Um, so, But I, I would test people's knives. And this is around the time when the whole um, lion steel controversy was happening. It's around the same time I got my hardness tester and stuff like that. If you're familiar with that whole thing, uh, Lion Steel, no, I was thinking of um, uh, who was it? Well, uh, it was like when uh, Steve, Super Steel Steve, was calling out someone. I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Lion Steel. Yeah, there. Were, I mean, there were definitely more than one company um, involved in that. But um, this is around two or three years ago when um, people were finally starting to realize that hardness matters. Um, and so we, people were, third parties were testing, um, other people's knives and finding that companies were not delivering on what they were promising on what was advertised, um, which is problematic. Um, because I mean, well, that's just, you know, it's just natural, right? Like false advertising is never a good thing. So, mm -hmm. um, that was the point at which I was just like, yeah, like, you know, if you guys are, if anyone who's in this discord or, you know, in the community wants to send me their knife, um, and pay me. Uh, to ship it back like so i'm not going to charge for the service of doing it but you just pay for shipping because shipping adds up yeah you know, if, I'm, I'm sure. if i'm paying if i'm if, if if 12 people send me their knives and i pay 10 dollars each to ship it back that's 120 bucks yeah. so yeah. i was like look just pay me shipping right and i'll test it for you right and as i kept testing more and more knives i kept seeing this knife is not in spec this knife is not in spec, you know? Um, and I was like, why, why are these knives not what they're promised? Um, did you see this across a broad range of brands? Yes. And also more specifically with certain steels like M390, right? It's a big one that is very commonly done poorly. Huh. Um, and you know, and I, I, you start noticing trends like, and at the end of the day, the only company that never really let me down like like big production company was Spiderco, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually why I made a video today, like talking about all the things I like about Spiderco on my Instagram page. I was just like, yeah, like Spiderco, good company. Like they're actually delivering. You know, actually, that's the irony. They don't tell you the HRC. Right? Oh. Spider <laughs> Sp Spiderco does not tell you the HRC range. They just quietly do a good job. Huh. 
Um, yeah. Whereas other companies are like, we do it to 60 to 62 and then it's not 60 to 62. And we're just like, what? <laughs> like, so, so yeah. well, what happened with Hinderer, Rick Hinderer knives? So this is just a, a normal day in my life. Or at least I thought it was going to be. Um, <laughs> so I, I actually really like Hinderer's designs. I've, I've talked about them. I've owned Hinderer's before several, um, or sorry, I've owned one Hinder before and, and handled or tested several. Hmm. Um, and so one of my customers actually, who's really, really nice and really generous said, Hey, I know you like the XM18. I don't have the exact version you want. Cause I wanted a specific version with a fuller and no flipper, but he's like, so I don't have the exact version you want, but I have a pretty cool one. And I'm willing to give it to you as a gift for free, just cause you know, I had a good experience with you buying a reblade. Um, and I just want to, you know, do something nice for you. So he gave it to, a hinderer for free. God, that's nice. And I was like, dude, I was stoked. Right. I was like, Oh my God. Like, that is so awesome, right? Um, and then I used it for like two months. And because I had tested so many hinders before, I just assumed that it was going to be in spec because all the other hinders I've ever tested were in spec. Um, they were all around 60 HRC or like slightly below, like 59.8, which is in spec because their spec mm -hmm. is 59 to 61. So I did not test this one for like two months. But as I kept using it, I was like, yo, this is not staying sharp. <laughs> like, mm. like I was like, this is not cutting. Like I, I've had other hinders. I've cut with other hinders. This is not cutting like my other hinders that I've tested, you know? So I said, okay, well I'm, I'm going to try sharpening it. Right. Because sometimes you have burnt edges, right. Which is, you know, he belt sharpens. So that's always a possibility. Um, you can overheat the edge, fatigue the steel. So it doesn't cut as long. So if you sharpen it, you remove the bad steel and expose good steel. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna sharpen it. Okay. Sharpen it still doesn't do well. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, that's clearly not enough. <laughs> so um, I tried other things. I tried, you know, regrinding it. Um, and that, you know, and obviously, you know, regrinding, getting it thinner and changing the edge angle will change performance because geometry is a huge factor in performance. But I was still like, this is not like my other hinders. Um, so, you know, I test, when I tested it, um, it was, uh, it came out to, uh, the first test was 58.6. And then I tested it like a bunch of other times and the average was 58.8. .8. And then that's like the lower end of a spec because 59 is 61 is a spec. So 58.8 .8 is like basically the same as 59. Yeah. And so I said on Instagram, I was like, okay, I think I figured out why it's not performing as well. Right. It seems to be on the softer side. Right. Um, and I posted like, look, I, I said, I said a bunch of things. Like I said, like personally, I would prefer if, um, you know, he just used other steels because <laughs> like it's a it's a it's a it's a hard use knife like you said these bigger robust steel or knives are hard use knives that's what they're marketed as so if you're gonna have these hard use knives i don't understand using a high carbide steel that's not very tough right um so i was like so i was like either run it harder so that i can actually cut things or use a different steel so i can like beat on it and have fun with it right like <laughs> but like right now i can't do anything with it like it's just not a fun knife for me to own even though i got it for free which is awesome I was just like, look, like I'm, I'm not that happy with this one. And I, and then what happened is, um, so I posted that and then you, I, I post this all the time. Like I just post my results. I just go, okay, this is the result. Like and I move on with my life. But what happened that made me really angry was that, um, Hinder had his shop manager whose name is, um, Sam or something like that, um, post on the official Facebook group that no one should trust the results referring to me of someone who's like, has an uncertified, uncalibrated hardness tester. And I was like, whoa, like, where did that come from? Like, like, cause I'm like, you don't even know. He said he doesn't even know who I am. So I was like, how do you know my hardness tester isn't calibrated or certified? Right? Yeah, right. I was like, how, you, if you don't, cause he said to people, he's like, I don't even know this guy. So I'm like, you can't just make that claim and try to delegitimize the test result without even knowing who I am or knowing if it's actually true. Um, so what I did is I posted an angry message. Um, basically what I did is I showed uh, a calibration and then I also showed my certification papers and I said, look, like I have the papers to prove that my hardness tester is calibrated, like that it reads properly. Um, and I, so I gave proof, right. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I was really upset. So like I said, some things that I don't stand by today. Like I called him a garbage maker cause I was so angry, but then, but I apologized. I was like, okay, I don't mean you're actually a garbage maker. I just think you're a bad person, <laughs> but, um, but, but essentially that's what happened. And 
I was very upset and it became and it became a big deal because people were like, yo, Rick, you can't just say things without any proof and then not apologize when proof gets presented, right? Like he made a claim. He said I was unprofessional, that I used an uncertified, uncalibrated tester. And then in the face of proof that none of that was true, his response was, okay, I'm going to send this guy a cease and desist. And that's when things really escalated um, because at this point, like, now he's threatening a lawsuit, right? Um, Because that's what it said in the letter. He said, look, we're taking this very seriously unless you make this apology video stating this and that. Like, oh. we're basically going gonna to sue you. So, and I was like, well, first of all, I personally thought I deserved an apology because um, he said things about me that weren't true, which I proved weren't true. So I was like, wait, why am I the one who needs to apologize? So, um, but the thing is, like, I'm poor. I, I work in my parents' garage, as you can see. And I can't afford a lawyer. So I started to GoFundMe and I just said, look, anyone who wants to, who cares about this, here's a GoFundMe. Any funds is going to be spent on a lawyer so that I don't have to apologize to hinder her. <laughs> and, um, and any money that is not spent on the lawsuit or, or on, is not spent on you know, responding to hinder her will go to charity. Right. That's how we'll do it. So I'm not profiting in any way from this. Right. I literally just do not want to apologize to hinder her and be forced to say things that I don't believe are true. Um, and that's what it came down to. Um, but it became a big deal because, you know, it's, it's an example of someone who couldn't take criticism um, yeah. because, you know, there are other companies, like I said, I've been doing this for two years. It's, this is not my first rodeo, right? Um, so other companies have always acted so politely and so graciously that I was shocked at Hinder's response because like if you, to give an example, I, uh, one, one of my friends sent me a wee knife. I don't remember the model cause this is before they gave knives names, mm -hmm. but the, the, the post is still on Instagram though. If you, if people want to look it up, but um, it was like a six Oh something was the number of the model and it came out soft. So um, we found out about it, right? I told we, I was like, look, this knife that my customer sent me to test is really soft. <laughs> and they said, Oh, we are really sorry about that send it back to us and we'll send you a new blade that's properly heat treated. That, that was their response. Good response. Yeah, that's that's the best response, right? Fix the problem and apologize. That's it. Mo Everyone was happy. Everyone said, good job, we. We move on with our lives, right? And that's, that's how things work. Like you, mistakes happen, lemons happen. I even said all the other hinders I tested were fine, right? They were in spec, even though I don't like the spec personally. Uh -huh. They were in spec. At least they were what was promised. Um, but instead of apologizing, he attacked me and then threatened a lawsuit. And so people had an issue with that. That's, that's, uh, kind of gangster. I, I, I remember he did a, uh, a cease and desist against someone who was making scales. I think it may have been RC blade works or someone. I, I do recall something like that. A couple well, of yeah. years back, the same thing, cease and desist. And, um, it was because he was making scales that had the, had the pattern, the had texture. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That texture. And I don't know how that was resolved, um, mm -hmm. but to me, he makes a knife. He started a company making knives uh, whose whose entire reason for being was for their customization. Uh, you know, make make your XM18 your XM18. Uh, but I think he meant only with uh, <laughs> certified <laughs> only from parts. me though. Only from me. Yeah. So. Uh, Okay, so he sends you this cease and desist letter. What does that mean? That means you have to stop talking about it. What does that mean? So what it is, is it's basically a warning, uh, but a very formal legal warning with a deadline. <laughs> um, so the deadline was actually yesterday um, where he said, look, basically the implication is if you don't agree to our demands, right? There are three demands. If you don't agree to our demands and, you know, make this apology video, um, before May 17th or on May 17th, then we're going to take legal action against you. That's basically what the letter means. Um, and so yesterday, because that was the deadline, I sent my response letter to Hinder. Um, and I, I hired a lawyer using the GoFundMe money to write the letter. Um, it, 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 was a, it took a lot of time, not going to lie. Like I had to like go through all my old posts, like take notes to explain things to the lawyer because not all lawyers are knife people. Right, <laughs> so I was right. like, look, this is what a hardness tester is. This is what happened. This is why the test is objective and not like, you know, subjective in any way. Um, and I explained all these things to my lawyer. And her conclusion was that everything I said is protected free speech. 
and that I hadn't broken the law in any way. And so I don't have to agree to any of his demands. So that's essentially what I responded, what the response letter, which is about four or five pages, that was, that's what's in the response letter, which is public um, for anyone to read. And um, now it, now it's just up to hinder, right? You know, he, whatever he responds in the next two weeks or so, um, we'll find out, right? You know, either he drops the case or he decides, I hate this guy, I'm going to sue him. Uh, you know, anything could happen, but yeah. It, it just seems like um, it's, it's, it's a bummer to hear to me because he's one of my knife heroes, you know, and, uh, and, and to me, uh, people like that, he, he does not stand to lose anything, uh, from you. You're not biting into his market share in any way. You might be showing that, uh, one of his knives is a lemon and you might even show over time that there's a pattern, uh, but that's his problem. That's not your problem. Mm -hmm. And, and to do this kind of, uh, uh bluff charge or maybe it's not a bluff but to to charge you like this is it's really kind of bully tactics i it leaves a really bad taste in my mouth uh as it did with the with the scales it's just people celebrating your knives oh okay he might be making uh you know ten dollars profit off the scales he makes for your knives um you know maybe you can charge him a vig i don't know it just seems a little thuggish it's it's interesting because you can come. Uh, what I do when I when I try to judge something is I compare it to other people's behavior. So you look at Demko for example. Demko makes a knife that's popular, right? The eighty twenty point five, mm -hmm. and he loves it when people customize them, right? He shares. You check his Instagram, his stories. He's always posting customized versions of the eighty twenty point five that people send to him or tag him, right? Like this is someone who clearly cares about the community loves that people enjoy his product and loves that he's supporting the aftermarket as well. Right. Like he is literally, I believe he's literally said like, I've uh, been quoted to say, I'm happy that people are modifying the knives like that. They can like, you know, buy scales that they want on their knife. Right. Cause all that really does, if you think about it is increase demand for his product, because yeah. if some people don't want the 80, 20.5 because it's in grivery, they don't like plastic, right. but you can get it in titanium. You can get it in carbon fiber. Okay, now I want one, right? Yeah. So it actually increases how many people want his knife. And he's a smart guy. So like he he understands that it's not someone stepping on his toes. It's someone actually just, you know, participating in the same market, but side by side, not against each other. Yeah, enhancing his brand. That's what yeah. they're doing. For for free, they're enhancing his brand. And uh, you know, that the, the um uh, thing about like a Demco, uh, I, I have like I showed you before the 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 shark's foot, which I, I I always say it's a it's a face only a mother could love. I think it's an ugly blade, but I love it, you know. And I I I I'm very fond of the Demco brothers and and everything they've done, and I I have most of the cold steels they ever uh, created, uh, and I like that attitude, you know. Whereas the the other just seems I don't know. Uh, it seems cheap and and defensive, and um, uh, he could be enhancing his brand instead of uh, sullying his his reputation. Because a lot of what I hear from people when I talk to them on this show is so much is about relationships with makers. Uh, you know, these relationships are ongoing, and makers tend to benefit from them when. Uh, people who are buying from them are patient because you're cool. A lot has to do with personality. No, I and I think you're really you are buying the maker. Like you are buying when you buy a knife, you're not just buying an object. You are literally buying a part of that maker's vision, what they stand for. Um, you're supporting what they stand for, right? Because you're obviously paying them money. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know that it's it's a big thing. And so you know that was the funny thing is that. Um, there was, there was this whole like, oh, you've caused me damages thing, right? Because like people are angry at me now. But I was like, no, people are angry at you because of how you handled it, not because there was a lemon, because everyone has lemons. Like yeah. there's no company that doesn't have lemons. My favorite company, Spyderco, can have lemons too, right? Um, that just happens. But, you know, even as recently as like a couple of days ago, um, I tested my Arcane Design crawler and it was a little bit soft. And how they responded was, look, I first I contacted Bestec, right? Because I think Bestec is responsible because they make the knife, right? They're the mm -hmm. OEM. And they said, Oh, sorry, we'll do an we'll immediately do an investigation, right? And I'm like, okay, that's all I wanted to hear. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just want to hear that you care. Um yeah. 
I wasn't at, I didn't ask for a refund. I didn't ask for a replacement. I just want to hear that you care. Right. Um, and then actually, um, the designer, uh, uh, Israel also reached out to me and just said, Hey, you know, if there's anything I can do to make it yeah. right or to fix things for you, like, let me know. And everyone was happy to hear that. Right. Cause that, that shows people he's someone who stands behind his product. It shows people that he actually cares about the customer. Yeah. Um, and people were like, yo, this is someone I want to support. Like when bad things happen in life, these are opportunities to show your true colors. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, I yeah. saw, I saw Israel's response to you and it was all class. I was like, geez, sorry. You know, let me know how I can hook you up. Do you want another knife? Uh, you know, yeah. I'll look into it. And you're like, no, it's all good. I just want to let you know. And I'm glad you care. Yeah. Um, and that's it. That's all. That's all you ever asked for, you know? So I think, I think people can learn from this. It's a learning opportunity for all makers that you don't need to attack people. Um, if you just, if you just, you know, treat people like humans and just be like, reach out and just, you know, say, sorry that this happened. Let me fix it. People aren't going to be mad at you. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think there's ever been a situation where someone has complained about a problem. The maker reached out and said, I'm so sorry. Let me fix it and do whatever I can to, you know, make this right. I don't think everyone's ever, anyone's ever responded saying, I hate you. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. You know what? People are pleased. It makes, it, it, you know, people are happy to see when someone, especially someone who, who might even seem beyond reproach, makes a mistake because we all make mistakes and we all feel like idiots when we do. And it's and it's how graciously someone handles it afterward. And so in a sense, it's it's like it's almost nicer to see uh, Israel's response to that letter than to never have had a soft bladed um, knife, because now we yeah. know how uh, how he is in a crisis or how he is in a situation where where he needs to put out a fire. He's going to do it calmly, nicely, and he's not going to go on the attack. I mean, that's yeah. That that's why I say you don't you 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 don't know who's gonna stab you in the back until the zombie apocalypse happens, right? But once it does happen, like that's when you find out. Like, so it's nice to know you can trust someone before, right? Like before things happen to you. Yeah. Um. Because yeah. Cause, yeah. Sorry. No, 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 no. Please, I I, I feel like uh, uh, there there's a lot more I want to talk about, and we'll we'll do a little uh, a little extra here for the for the patrons. But sure. One thing I want to bring up quickly. Um. Uh which is an issue kind of parallel to this. And that's uh, something that happened with this knife, uh, this goose works that I love um, and, and famously happened with Jake Hoback, uh, which is this making knives elsewhere. And then maybe not saying that they were made in the United States, but not correcting people when they say the knife is made in the United States. So uh, I'm just kind of bringing it back to the beginning when you talked about transparent knives and being transparent, what is your take on, um, on some of these American companies who who are at least lying by omission. Yeah, my position on lying by omission is very, very simple. It's the same as just lying. Um, you know, so to give an example of this, like one thing that I do is when customers notify me of a problem, I always say, I'm so sorry, let me fix it, right? And then out of respect for me, my customers choose to keep it a secret. In other words, they don't put me on blast for it because I fixed the problem. But my response to that is not to say the problem never happened. I put myself on blast for it. So if you go through my Instagram, anytime there's ever been an issue that I've discovered because a customer told me about it, I make it public. I say, hey, this customer reached out to me and said they had this problem. If anyone else had this problem, let me know. I'll fix it, right? I want people need to be proactive. That is what the truth is. Truth is proactivity. So if you're just allowing things to, you know, be secret, allow people to think there's no problems. To me, that's the same as lying personally. Um, so, you know, like recently, like um, I'm not happy it happened, but it happened, right? Where some of the bug outs, um, re reblades that I did had a lock failure on spine whacking, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, that's a clear problem, right? So first of all, I told the customer, okay, like I will give you a full refund or I'll make you a new blade, first of all, right? But also let me go ahead and post on Instagram, letting other people know that this happened to you just in case it could happen to them, right? Because I don't want anyone to have an unsafe knife. So I encouraged my customers. I said, yo, if you have a blade for me, go ahead and spine whack it. And if it fails, I will cover it. Like that, that's being proactive. That's, yes. you know, that is, 
you know, not trying to say, oh, if people don't notice the problem, it's not a problem. No, yeah, it's, a, right. it's a problem whether or not people notice it. Well, um, it, it that will always be in the back of your mind. When is this going to come back and bite me? If right, I, if, exactly. If I, too, like, I mean, to speak totally selfishly. Uh, but second of all, I mean, that could be a real issue. You know, it's yeah. a knife. And and presumably you, you you make some damn sharp knives and to have something like that fail could be, you know, could really change the course of someone's life. So, right. It's like, how do you sleep at night knowing that something you made might hurt someone because you haven't told them the possibility that it might fail? Right. Right. And you don't, no one wants to say my knives might fail. Right. Cause like that doesn't look good. Right. Like you, people want to be perfect. People want to be able to say my knives never fail. But guess what? Like it happens. Right. Even Riot, which is like the, the, the gold standard of production knives, they have recently had knives with lock failure. Hmm. Right. So like, um, and so it's like, it happens to everyone. And so instead of being ashamed of it, just be a step ahead of it and just say, Hey, look, I'm aware that this has happened on one or two, which means it could happen more than one or two times. Right. right. Check, be safe, check your knife, give it a couple light taps. If, it, if it's fine, it's fine. Right. Then there's no problem. And if it's not fine, then I can fix it for you. And then it won't be a problem anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's how I think about it. So lying by omission, just as bad, like just as bad as just normal lying personally. I, I, I agree. And as a matter of fact, I think it looks worse in the end when you're outed, it looks worse because it's obvious you're, oh, I'm not lying. You know, it looks like obfuscation because that's what it is. And the thing, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to call out Jake Hoback here. The thing that really sticks in my craw is that, uh, all of his knives, you know, have a Psalm quote, Psalm 23 on it, you know, and he quotes the Bible. It's like, well, there, there are a couple of things in the Bible that maybe you need to pay attention to first you know, mm -hmm. like truth and being truthful and, yeah. uh, and not lying to your customers. But that's a conversation for another time. Brian, thank you so much for joining me on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was really interesting to find out about you and also about what you're, what you're going through, the, the tribulations of this business. And uh, I find it very interesting. And I think people can, can uh, glean a lot from it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I, I had a lot of, uh, I had a lot of fun actually being on. Um, I just like talking about knives. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's what we're here for. Thanks so much, Brian. And uh, take care, sir. Thank you. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. I've been talking a long time about trying to find someone to regrind my ZT0452CF Sinkovich, and I saw he has one on his page, and he did an awesome job. So I think I found someone to regrind that awesome knife and actually make it a great cutter. Anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. You'll see that when it's done uh, right here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Be sure to join us uh, on Thursday night for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m., standard uh, eastern standard time right here on youtube facebook and twitch uh and also uh if you like the show and you want to support it go to the knife slash patreon until next time and for jim working his uh switcher and his magic i'm bob demarco saying don't take dull for an answer thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast if you enjoyed the show please rate and review at review the for show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.